Why in cell 2? In this chapter, we focus on the membrane protein. The membrane proteins, we have the channel and the carrier. They make the molecules move from the high concentration to the low concentration area. And they were used to transport a small molecule and charged particles. So we have the sodium channel and glucose carrier. They are the examples. Carrier proteins. So these are the uh, membrane protein that move the molecules, small molecules like glucose, from still goes from high concentration to the low concentration area. So their uh, driving force, the energy is the concentration gradient. And you can watch this video, it talks about the carrier protein. And for this kind of carrier mediated transport. They use the membrane protein to help them to move the molecule uh, like from high to low, uh, like glucose carrier. They have specificity. So each membrane protein, like glucose carrier, only carry glucose. So they have different uh, proteins carry different stuff. They have the saturation. They can be saturated. Think about the carrier like the shuttle. So they have the limited seat. So all the limited seat, when they've been binded, they're saturated, so they have the transport maxima. And uh, that's why diabetes patients have to watch the, the blood sugar level because they don't want their blood sugar level go over uh, their limit, reach the saturation, and they reach the transport maxima. So they could not handle those glucose anymore. And what's going to happen is they're going to have glucose go into their urine and this diabetes. So they have the transpiration rate based on the number of carrier. It's like during the rush hour, they can increase the number of the, the shuttle for transportation. And uh, after we eat a big meal, we while well, body release glucose. Glucose function is to put more glucose carrier. And diabetes two patient, their uh, the disease is their body become insensitive to glucose. So it turn out they are not, not able to increase the number of glucose carrier. It's like during the rush hour, they could not increase more shuttle to carry those passengers. So they have a blood sugar problem. And these carrier are subject to competition. So they can, you can use a medicine or other molecules to block the, the carrier. And those carrier protein can be divided into the passive and active transport. So passive, they don't require ATP. ATP is the biological energy. Uh, the driving force still goes, uh, is the concentration gradient. So the molecule still goes from high concentration to low concentration area. They just need a helper. So we call them facilitated diffusion. Active transport, this time you're moving the molecule from low concentration to the high concentration area. This won't naturally happen, so you need to give them an energy. And the energy, biological energy, is ATP. So the difference of these two, passive transport, they use concentration gradient as the energy source. Active transport, they use ATP as the energy source. So we start from the facilitated diffusion, and that's the movement. They move the molecule from the high concentration to the low concentration area. Glucose carrier, that's an example. So there's a glucose carrier. They can move the blood sugar. So the, the sugar stay in your blood with the blood sugar and from high to low. So there's another picture show you the same thing. Facilitated dif uh, diffusion, glucose transporter, glucose carrier. And uh, your your insulin its function is to ask muscle, skeletal muscle, to put more glucose carrier on. So after you eat a big meal, your glucose level is high, well, they're going to put more glucose carrier to take glucose in, so your, your blood sugar level can be maintained. And when your body becomes insensitive to glucose, that's diabetes. And when you, that's when your blood sugar regulation has problem. Homeostasis of blood sugar has problem. For those require ATP, we call them pump. So we have the primary active transport. And like calcium pump. 
So every cell inside the calcium level is low, it's very low, and outside is high. And they are able to do that because they have the calcium pump. So this calcium pump, you need to use energy because they are moving the molecule from low to high. This won't naturally happen. And you use ATP as an energy source, you pump calcium inside, low to the outside, high. And the energy source is ATP. And that's another example called sodium potassium pump. Every living cell has sodium potassium pump. You use ATP as energy source, you take the potassium and pump the potassium from uh, low, that's the outside, to high, that's the inside, and pump the sodium from low, that's the inside, to the high outside. So eventually, uh, every living cell, the outside has high sodium, and inside has high potassium, and because of the sodium potassium pump. So you can think this is the AC system works 24 hours a day, 7 days a week in every living cell. So that's the uh, sodium potassium pump, and you can watch this YouTube. He explained the sodium potassium pump. Use ATP as energy source and pump sodium and potassium against the concentration gradient. And so far, the previous two examples, uh, they are primary active transport. Let's look at the secondary. Secondary transport, like this one, glucose sodium symporter. It still moves glucose from low to high, so it's working against the concentration gradient. But instead of using the ATP as an energy source, it used the concentration gradient of sodium or other ions as an energy source. So sodium is high outside, low inside. And it, it, sodium love to go from high to low. And it, it, it create a double binding site, one for sodium, one for glucose. So when both of them bind with the binding site, sodium love to move in, and it will transport glucose from low to high. So this is called the sodium glucose symporter. And Every time we talk about active, passive, we look at the cell. It's in the cell's point of view. The cell still need to use the ATP to pump the sodium to low to high, create the sodium concentration gradient. So in the cell's point of view, this is still a, a active transport. So the secondary active transport usually pair with the primary active transport. And it used the concentration gradient of the first molecule to move the second molecule against the concentration gradient. And that's the definition. So that's the example. Sodium glucose symporter used the concentration gradient of the sodium in order to move glucose against the concentration gradient, secondary active transport. And this secondary active transport, they can be a symporter like the sodium glucose importer, they can be an antiporter like the hydrogen sodium antiporter. They can move in the opposite direction. But the same concept, use the concentration gradient of the first molecule to move the second molecule against the concentration gradient. So this is the sodium glucose symporter, and you can watch this video talk about uh, the activity of this membrane protein. Okay, so we finish the difficult one. Uh, then we talk about the bigger scale, vas vascular transport. So this molecule, they need to move in or move out. And they will create a, a vesicle. Vesicle is like a membrane uh, created a bubble. So the molecule they want to move, they put inside the bubble in the vesicle. And if they move them out, we call them exocytosis. For example, your uh, neurons release neurotransmitter. They're going to put neurotransmitter here, they move out. That's exocytosis. If they move in, that's endocytosis. Like your white blood cell, they uh, detect the bacteria and they move in endocytosis. So they can move in, move out. They all require ATP, so they're still active transport. And that's the exocytosis. Move them out. Move them out of the cell. And endocytosis moving in. 
So it depends on the scale, we can put them into three different categories, phagocytosis, pinocytosis, receptor-mediated endocytosis. Phagocytosis, uh, sometimes you see the book say the, the cell eating. And the pino, sometimes they say the cell drinking, so this is a big bite, this is a small bite. So you have the passive transport, we talk about all this, and today we talk about the active transport. Okay, the, the channel, let's look at the ion channel. Ion channels, they are for ions, charged particles to move. And sometimes you have the leak channel, they just stay there and remain open. So the sodium can go from, sodium is high outside, low inside, so they can go through the leak channel from high to low. Uh, potassium, potassium uh, is high inside, low outside. So potassium can go through the potassium leak channel and just go from high, this inside, to the low outside. But most of these ion channels, they are closed, so they have a gate. They call them gated channel. You can open them. So it depends on what mechanism to open them. We have different kind of gated ion channel. And we can put them into three different categories. Voltage gated, chemically gated, and mechanically gated. Depends on how we open them. So the voltage gated ion channel depends on the voltage. We will talk about it in the muscle and also in the neuron. Uh, they sense the voltage change and they will open. When the open ion flows through, of course. So the voltage gated ion channel. Chemically gated ion channel, uh, also called the ligand gated ion channel. Uh, the chemical molecule will bind with it, like this example. This could be a neurotransmitter, could be a hormone. You will bind with this ion channel. When they bind, and this ion channel open. And when they open, ion can flow through. So it still goes from high concentration to the low concentration. Uh, so the gated ion channel, they are they're actually facilitated diffusion. So the molecules, the, dri the driving force is concentration gradient, different from the active transport. The third one called the mechanically gated ion channel, the mechanical force open and close the gate. So the uh, this is the hair cells. We will find this in unit five when we talk about the, the auditory system, the hair, inner hair cells in your auditory system. They are mechanically gated ion channel. So when they vibrate, they move to one direction and move back, and this mechanically gated ion channel will be pulled open. When it pulls open, the ions flow in. When the ions flow in, the inside become positive. So they can change the sound into the cell's response, mechanically gated ion channel. The last one is called the water channel echoporin, also called the echoporin. Uh, water channel, water gonna go through the cell membrane through osmosis. We learned that in previous chapter. And you say, why you need water channel? In certain specific body part, you need to regulate water. For example, your, uh, your, your kidney. So you don't want those water become urine and come back to, to your body, then what's the point? So in the kidney, they make the membrane thicker. So especially in the end process of the urine, in the nephron, nephron are the, the tubes in the kidney. In the collecting duct, that's the last part of the nephron, they, 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 they create the urine. And in that part, they don't, want, don't, they don't want water to go back because that's the urine. And they are able to regulate how much water your body wants to take back by putting more or less aquaporin. So that's the, that's the water channel. And it turned out when your body are dehydrated, they will put more aquaporin and more water being taken back. So you, you keep the water and your urine is very, very concentrated. And if your body has too much water, they will put less aquaporin and more water will go to your urine and your urine become more diluted. And that's how we, our body are able to regulate the concentration of your, the urine. And the main point is to maintain water homeostasis, your, your osmol osmolarity, your body concentration. So your urine concentration varies a lot. Okay, that's it.